Um, so to introduce our first speaker for the day, uh, Rowley Partinen from Synergetic. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the enlightening stuff. Uh, the report is coming out in s Next English. Week. Yes. Yes. So I will be getting my my copy. Some good scale there. Um, pleased to be be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to say a couple words about. Oh wow! Immediately we got the wrong slide. What's happening here? Maybe I don't trust this. Thing. So, Raul, who, I am, who am I? I'm a science writer, analyst, communicator on energy, climate, nuclear. Uh, I'm also an environmental activist. So I was one of the co-founders of the Eco-Modernist Society of Finland and have done a lot of work with them. I also helped co-found the uh, European Replanet Networks, one of the sponsors of this, this event. Um, and in 2018, I again co-founded and I'm now leading this non-profit think tank called Think Atom. And today I'm excited to be here as a representative of Synergetic, which I joined a couple months ago. So I'm going from thinking to writing about it to actually doing it. <laughs> this is not going to work. Uh, no, no, I have my own this kind of weird device that wow. works whenever I'm not on stage. Let's try this one. Um, yeah, it's a MacBook. It doesn't have a USB. Uh. <laughs> I'll just stand here so I, also I won't fall. Uh, about Think Atom, so uh, like I said, it's a non-profit independent think tank. We try to think about how to decarbonize the various sectors, mainly with new nuclear energy, be it small, tiny, large, new, old, high temperature, low temperature, whatever. And then try to tell the public that, yes, somebody should do this. After a couple of years of doing that, I'm realizing that nobody is still not yet doing it, so that's why I joined with Synergetic. Um, and today, I'm mostly talking about stuff related to shipyard nuclear in Finland uh, report, but not from the Finnish scale. So I'll get back to that. All of these publications you can download from, from the URL address there. So freely available. So what's Synergetic about? It's about scaling up clean fuels. This is our vision. We will deliver highly standardized large projects. We have a good partnership with Team Korea. So the people who delivered the Barakah nuclear power project in UAE, which is probably the most successful delivery of a nuclear project in the last 30 years. Um, in partnership with them, uh, we want to deliver large scales of liquid fuels, carbon neutral, cost competitive and globally available. I do need to point out that we are not a reactor vendor. We are a reactor customer. So it's a project development company. And uh, the basis for, for this company is pretty much in these two reports. So missing link to a livable climate, how hydrogen enabled synthetic fuels can help deliver the Paris goals. Came out in 2020, I was one of the co-authors there. And then the, the, the crew also did a study called Rethinking Deployment Scenarios for Advanced Reactors for the Electric Power Research Institute. And Thies had on his slides this nuclear cost drivers study. So it's the same people who wrote that study and the same people who wrote these studies. And basically what we are trying to do is to take all of the learning from that cost driver study and bring it to real projects so that we can go on budget, on schedule, and deliver at large scale. And the basic thesis is, is something like this. What do the customers want? Well, we've learned that they want to decarbonize faster but the energy is not available at scale and at low enough cost. 
customers mainly want drop-in fuels. So they don't want to rebuild all of their facilities and infrastructure and stuff like that. If they have a facility that needs hydrogen, which is now made from synthetic fuels, uh, not synthetic fuels, but fossil fuels, we replace that with the same hydrogen, but made clean, to put it very bluntly. And then this also expands into into liquid fuels like jet fuel and and, and uh, natural gas. And the thing is that they cannot cost three to five times more, which is now the case, pretty much. So if you want to scale, you need to be competitive at at the price level as well. And we think that the market is, is not limited by demand. If you can deliver these kinds of products, the demand is, is practically limitless. And this is something uh, that we are doing at the moment. So we are talking with all of the important stakeholders, the development partners. So we are talking, for example, with oil producers. They're very interested in, in this kind of aspect, making not fossil fuels, but synthetic fuels. They also, as you see from the oil and gas prices, they have a lot of money right now, which is good. We are also talking with the off-takers, so the customers for the, their end products, so uh, airlines, refineries, and, and steel mills, stuff like that, who would be interested in clean hydrogen and fuels. We are talking with the technology providers, so that might be your nuclear reactor developer or, or uh, electrolyzer manufacturer or ammonia plant manufacturer. And then we are also working with the Team Korea, which is part of the Synergetic, uh, to kind of already come up with a delivery plan to get these going. Because I, we think that now is, well, everybody's realizing that this is urgent. So we cannot, as T said, we cannot keep on doing studies and, and, and talking for the next 5, 10, 15 years, and then, oops, we are still in the same shit. So we have to start acting. And we are raising capital for for our activities as well. Good, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the global scale of the market and the European uh, T's went into the Netherlands situation, which was, wow, uh, 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 there's a lot of reactors coming up here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, I will try to make it so. Uh, probably you've seen this image a million times already. It's from the IPCC 2018 special report on 1.5 degrees warming. It does not look very likely. Like the, the, the scale and the urgency are immense. But I, I do want to remind you that this is what our politicians have agreed to push for. So we just need to move into the action phase. From another perspective, this is the baseline scenario from the EIA a year ago on global primary energy consumption by fuel. As you can see, they see that fossil fuels will actually increase. That's not compatible with the stable climate that we want. So 170 petawatt hours, that's a new term for some, not terawatt hours, but petawatt hours, it's the next step. In, in 2050, globally. And even this is quite a big growth for renewables, actually. Growing at least three times from, from current levels. And for perspective, I have here one billion tons of hydrogen as an energy content. So if we want to replace those fossil fuels with clean alternatives, we need at least three, four, five billion tons of clean hydrogen, right? So here's the scale. There's solar, there's wind, there's nuclear. That's what we have now. The next two, so there's the IPCC 2018 average nuclear in 2050. It's about four times our current one. And the IEA net zero nuclear, uh, a net zero report from a year ago that had about three times, two times our current nuclear. And then there is the what we actually need to make just 1 billion tons of hydrogen. You start to see the opportunity here. <laughs> like, this was not 
spreading lies. He was he was preaching the truth as the on the on the on the scale of the things. But they the hydrogen that we can then use to make ammonia or synthetic hydrocarbons, it needs to be competitive to reach the scale to actually replace these fuels. Because if it's not if it's more expensive, it'll never fly. So how cheap? If we talk about ammonia, ammonia is a bit easier to make than synthetic hydrocarbons because we've been doing it for, for 100 years already and there is a lot of nitrogen, which is the, one of the base elements there in the atmosphere, like 70% is nitrogen. So it's easier to do. So we need hydrogen at, let's say, below 1.5 euros or dollars per kilogram. But then when you start to, if you want to do synthetic fuels, like Jet A uh, for, for, for flying around, we really need to go below one. And if you bring that into perspective with the levelized cost of electricity that you need to make this thing, it all, obviously it depends on the, also on the efficiency of the electrolyzer and, and something like that, but it's in the 20 bucks per megawatt hour neighborhood. We need to make nuclear really cheap. On the European uh, addressable market, so this is a study from a study done by the Finnish gas grid. Uh, came out last year. They they did a meta study of all these studies that have been done on the European scale and, and to see what what's the landscape for for hydrogen demand. So by twenty. 30, you would need between some, somewhere between 50 and 100 gigawatts of electric capacity as the input energy to meet that hydrogen demand. And by 2050, you, you, you need up to 340 gigawatts. So that's a big growing market. And that's base load. So if you do it with wind and solar, then you multiply it by three or five or whatever. Then you have the global ammonia market. You know that we basically eat ammonia today, so that's our food source. We use it uh, in agriculture as fertilizer. It's about 180 million tons of year, per year. So if you would make that with electrolyzers, you would need about 150 gigawatts. But the shipping industry has been talking about moving into clean fuels as well, and ammonia is one of the prime candidates for that. So if, if a lot of the shipping industry moves into that direction, we might triple the ammonia demand by 2050, which would mean 400 gigawatts of demand for, for clean energy. That, that's pretty much the same as the current global nuclear fleet. And lastly, we like to fly. I first flew from Helsinki to Stockholm and then from Stockholm to Kalmar. I went to Oskarsham, then came back on the next day, flew back to Stockholm. Then I flew into Amsterdam yesterday and tomorrow I will fly back to Helsinki. Yes, I know it's bad. <laughs> but it's bad because they are made, uh, the, the jet fuel is made from uh, fossil fuels. And we are seeing a lot of growth in the flight industry. So it might double to about 5 million barrels, barrels per year, which we will need 1,600 gigawatts of capacity to make synthetically. And today these SAF fuels, they cost in the neighborhood of three to four times as much as the fossil. So they are fine, but they have to come down in cost if we want to scale them up. And then there is this. The environmental footprint, just like the physical area that you need for your energy production. It starts to matter when you actually start to replace fossil fuels outside electricity as well. So here, I, I actually did, well, you had 60 gigawatts of offshore wind. 60, yes. 60. If you, if you would do the Netherlands, you would require 29 
9,000 square kilometers, and that's about two thirds. Well, it's it, it's about half the splotch that you see there next to England. Yeah, that yeah, that's about the yeah. ballpark. So you're going to be in competition with Belgians because they also need that amount of wind. <laughs> And you have a limited space there. There's UK, UK as well. So um, yeah, let's see if that 60 gigawatts. I, I think that not everybody, every one of the countries can build as much. So you, you need to come into an agreement who gets to build the offshore wind. Uh, but yeah, then you have the solar. There the square, square. And then there's a tiny, tiny, tiny. I don't know if you see it. The green plot. That's the nuclear power plant that makes all this happen as well. So at this large scale, this actually starts to matter. Renewables like wind and solar, as much as I like them, they will face increasing opposition if we try to get them everywhere. And at some point, it's just not physically possible anymore. Good, now you have the background. Let's get into the exciting stuff. So stuff that we at Synergetic are working on. There's three uh, dif different deployment architectures that we are looking into. I will briefly go over the first. So repowering coal. What's that about, you might ask. And I might answer is that we have two terawatts of coal plants in the world. The median age of those coal plants is 14 years. So they have a lot of lifetime left in them. We really need to find a way to remove the coal boiler and add something else that's clean. And not just for the emissions, but also for the social aspects. Because these coal plants have been energy hubs. The whole communities have been built around these in often, often times. You cannot just expect these people to pack their things and, and go somewhere else. There will be opposition at the local level, and then that will seep into the national level, and it will make harder and harder and harder to replace coal plants, especially if they have economic lifetime in them. But if you can replace the coal boiler with an advanced heat source, such as a nuclear reactor, well, that would be awesome, right? So the basic idea of this is something like this. I'm not going to go in too deeply, but there, here's the advanced heat source system. So the reactor, it's inside a standardized building that's seismically isolated. So you can pretty much put it anywhere. And then you use thermal energy storage, storage such as a molten salt uh, to delink the nuclear island from the turbine island in the in the coal plant so that you get you don't have to deal with the safety case for the whole plant you use a molten salt storage in between so you only have to worry about the nuclear building that you pop into place and not about the whole whole plant. It also increases the flexibility because you can store heat in the in the heat storage. Well, obviously. <laughs> and this will help protect those jobs and communities and keep those power plants operational, maybe for t decades. Uh, and by reusing the transmission, the, the, all the infrastructure outside of the coal boiler, you actually make it economically feasible to replace the, or repower the coal plant much sooner. So you don't have to wait it for it to be 40 years old. You can do it much, much earlier, which would be amazing for, for emissions. And this is actually an initiative that's been pushed by our kind of non-profit daughter organization called Terra Praxis, which has a lot of the same people behind. And uh, just recently, actually last week, we published 
press release on, on the topic that there's been a strategic partnership signed with Microsoft, who is helping with making a tool, um, basically an online tool with, with some of the architecture uh, firms out there as well, that a coal uh, plant owner can go and, and input his parameters, his plant, like basic stuff, and the tool will automatically create for him what would it look like to have his coal plant repowered. So you wouldn't need to make these feasibility studies that might cost hundreds of thousands. You just go to a website, input your stuff, half a day, and it's done. And you can see if it's feasible, if you should pursue, pursue this. So it's making the kind of first step a lot easier for the coal plant owner to start looking into this. The second deployment architecture that we have is a refinery scale hydrogen gigafactory. Sounds exciting. The, the basic idea is to bring the factory to the project. And we do it like this. Here is a refinery site, like used to do fossil fuels. So it's a kind of industrial site already. But instead of using crude oil, we start to make we build a factory that makes SMRs right next to the actual gigafactory, which might have, in this example, it has 36 SMRs. So if, and, and in, in our studies, we use this example of 600 megawatt thermal SMR, which is like medium sized option. So that would translate into about 21 gigawatts of total thermal capacity which we can then use to make hydrogen, synthetic fuels, ammonia, either thrown into a pipeline or shipped to the global market. And the idea here is to, it's similar that Elon Musk has been doing. He knows that he has demand for a lot of batteries. So he builds an enormous battery factory which then lowers his cost, but he can take that risk because he knows that he will always have demand for those batteries. We know that we have demand for 36 reactors, so we can invest into a factory, make those 36 reactors. Then maybe after that, we can use the factory to and, and make more reactors and just export them. But the cost will come down dramatically. That's the basic idea. And obviously you can do the same thing with, with the electrolyzers and, and all the other stuff that you need for the Gigafactory. Here's a, another point of view on the, on, the, on the Gigafactory under construction. And then, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, you have some refineries here, right? We also have some in Finland and, and, and yeah, the, the scale, as we've learned, is immense. And when you start to look at that scale that, oh, well, 20 gigawatts sounds like a lot, but if you replace a factory, that's like a, a refinery. That's not a big refinery because the scale in the oil business is much bigger. The last one that was in the, in the title of the presentation, nuclear ships and synthetic fuels. So shipyard manufactured clean synthetic fuels. Let's get into it. Why shipyards? Well, there's a hint in the in the graph. <laughs> why why would we want to do something with shipyards? Well, first, if you do stuff in series that that shipyards are capable of, it lowers cost. If you have a controlled environment in which you build your power plant, like what Rolls Royce is actually proposing with their factory setting lowers cost further. The actual power plant will be built off-site. And at first glance, that's like, yeah, yeah, fine, whatever. But when you start to think about it, when you build a nuclear power plant today, you first spend five years, depending, preparing the site and, and doing all that other work, licensing the site and stuff like that. Now you can do that at the same time as somebody 
is already building your power plant. So it can half your time. In, and, and in case of of short siding, that might there might be no need for for site preparation. And the last one, uh, why shipyards is scale. So the world has about 280 shipyards in operation. That that number is from 2019, so it might have shifted one way or another. And they produce thousands of large ships each year. So we are already doing this at enormous scale, much bigger than what the nuclear industry has been doing. We think that, yeah, nuclear power plants, they are big and, and huge project. These shipyards move shit around at like 10 times that easily in a single shipyard. You can. Um, okay, yeah, good, good question. Not necessarily. The shipyard is there to assemble the plant, which would be a barge that has a nuclear reactor that might have been built somewhere else and then brought to the shipyard. Depending on the capabilities and, and the type of reactor and what the shipyard can do. Good. Yeah, basically a shipyard, well, if you compare shipyard manufacturing to Tradi traditional construction project, you have the professionals there all the time working in, in their own teams. Whereas if you start a new construction project in the middle of nowhere, then you get hundreds, even thousands of pro professionals who maybe never work with each other, come from all over the world, speak in different languages. So that aspect alone is huge for the productivity. Then you have the quality assurance and, 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 and stuff like that, which is much easier to do in a fixed setting. Yeah, we, and, and we had a webinar and uh, a professor of MIT, the global board journal, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, researchers. He, research, and he says the most expensive to build nuclear reactors are logistics, logistics chain and uh, people knowledge. Yeah. And here you eliminate all that. Like I said in the beginning, our aim is to take all the kind of cost adding stuff away from the project and, and do it in a way that minimizes this and maximizes efficiency. There's some studies on, on the productivity per worker hour done. So construction at a site, that's the least productive way we can do things. And construction at a shipyard or a manufacturing factory, that's the most construct uh, productive way and and I think the difference in in that study was something like 2.5 times more productive so it's very significant and then you also have the the regulator can come to the fixed location and and it's just a lot easier to do that way why barges why do offshore siding well you could basically build nuclear power plants at a shipyard and then just ship them somewhere and, and put them on a land, I guess, at least in modules. And, and I think that is something we already do at, at some scale. At least the Finnish shipyards have been involved in Olkiluoto 3 and, and all the other stuff. Well, you don't need land, which I, I think the people in Netherlands sympathize with. <laughs> there's a lot of people, so there will be, I don't say, no NIMBY, but there will be less NIMBY because you can you can put this near shore, obviously in a kind of harbor setting, that you it's almost like on land, and you can enclose even the kind of to control all the environment, but you can also make this as something that are a couple of kilometers, like an offshore wind farm, farm, and then just have a cable and supply the electricity on shore, and it's on nobody's backyard. You don't need the groundworks I mentioned. Pouring the nuclear grade concrete is a headache. Uh, maybe it's something that the GE Hitachi people have, have been thinking a lot, minimizing the concrete in the, in, the, in the design. So if you are building a steel ship, there's almost no concrete. 
I mean, you can use it for radiation protection of the reactor stuff and, and, and something like that, but it's much, much less. And it's again, it's done in a controlled environment, not in the winter when everything's raining down and, and stuff like that. And you can tow it anywhere. So the market risk becomes much smaller. Let's say you make a power purchasing agreement for 10 years outside Netherlands. And then crazy people take over and they are very anti-nuclear and they want to terminate that that PPA after 10 years. Now you don't have a stranded asset in your nuclear power plant. You can just pop it up, tow it to another more sensible market, make another PPA, and keep on your business. This lessens the market risk also for the financing side and the investors. And in the end of the life cycle, maybe 30 years, you can tow it to a central location to do the decommissioning, which is again much more effective than tracking hundreds of people from around the world to take the plant apart in the middle of the forest. Yes? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> let's let's not go into that discussion. Uh, obviously, they need to be handled, yeah. uh, and we are talking with regulators, with initial initial discussions with regulators. It, it let's just say that it depends. Obviously, if you have a because a ship, if you have it floating, it's never s still like like if you have a. So you need to design for that. Basically, that's the answer. Design for offshore floating. But you can also do it in a, in a way that, OK, you have a ship. You just bring it near your harbor, and you actually moor it to the ground. So it's not floating anymore. But it's still, it's still surrounded by water and, and basically a ship. And then you, when you want it out, you just leave the level of water and, and the ship, you know. So this is something that we will obviously be addressing and, and maybe talking with also the like I said, we are not reactor vendors. We want our, react, uh, uh, our uh, reactor vendors to think about these things so that we can design a ship that has not their reactor and then deliver that. But good question. Always bring up the safety. <laughs> <clears throat> and yeah, you have cooling water. It's like you have a plug. If something happens, water comes in, cools the reactor. Basically, um, this is not a very kind of great communications point of view, but as a final barrier of defense, you could even imagine that if everything goes wrong and then you really need to do something about the reactor, you can either tow it away from population like farther into the sea so that there will be no, nobody near the radiation, or take the plug, let it sink to the bottom, and then it will be cool there. And you design it in a way, obviously, that you can later go and retrieve your reactor and, and deal with it. Like I said, this is maybe not the first thing you want to say. <laughs> but from a regulatory perspective, it's a safety feature. It's another way for you to prevent people getting any radioactivity. So here's a picture of modular construction at, at the shipyard. So. That's why it's efficient. And here's an example of a big pick that we used. Uh, we used uh, actually an F FPS, so it's floating production storage and, and offloading facility that they use in the in oil and gas industry. So we had one of their big ships as an example and then made a kind of nuclear version of it. This has 1.2 gigawatts of power, so it's it's on the bigger you could also have, I, I think the, in our kind of preliminary analysis, it's somewhere between maybe 400 to 600 megawatts. That's the sweet spot where you still get the kind of benefits of scale, uh, but it becomes more manageable. But you could use this to produce 12,000 barrels of oil equivalent in, in ammonia. And then you could have these parked in a harbor somewhere, seven of these they could produce 5% of the global ammonia demand. So 1.2 million tons per year. 
lowest cost, lowest carbon ammonia that you can get. There'll be a customer for that. And just to kind of give you another point, uh, viewpoint on the scale of the thing, let's say we now use about 100 million barrels of oil or something similar per day. That's about 10,000 of these ships. Sounds like a lot, right? We now have less than 500 reactors. Suddenly there should be 10,000 nuclear ships. But the thing is, there are 60,000 ships sailing the seas at this very moment. And as I said, the shipyard industry already delivers thousands of large ships every year. So let's say we make 500 nuclear ships in a year, that 10,000 ships will take 20 years. Sounds like a plan. And there's some examples of the kind of potential partners and customers. How many ships would they need? How many ships would Exxon Mobil need to replace their 4 million barrels of oil production? It's just 334 of these big ones. And there's a graph on how that scale up might go. So you have new ship construction annual rate. Uh, by 2025, we're very optimistic with these time, time scales. There's al already hundreds of ships, and then in, in, in the end we end up with, uh, with about a thousand or more ships per year. And just to give the uh, environmental perspective, one of these big ships, if it would replace coal power, that's about 10 million tons of avoided emissions per year. If it replaces natural gas, it's about half that. You have fossil hydrogen, it's about 2 million tons. And then depending on, on what kind of product and, and end use you are replacing on, on liquid fuels, it's about between 1 to 3 million tons per year. So, in summary, if we can repower coal, and if we can deliver these refinery scale hydrogen refineries, and there's some orders coming in already, <laughs> And if we can substitute 100 million barrels of oil per day with the shipyard thing, what do we have? We have new primary energy. Thank you. I have no idea how much time I have left if there's some questions. Please, somebody, okay. Excellent question. There is a hierarchy that, that one takes. Uh, obviously, the, the kind of lowest hanging fruit would be bio-based carbon from places like pulp mills or, or well, it, obviously you could do it also with fossil carbon, but that's not a really good proposition. It just halves the fossil emissions basically from that. It's still getting into the atmosphere. But you could do bio-based uh, bio carbon um, from a, a smokestack, basically. So carbon capture and, and utilization. Then you have the option of doing it from the seawater or the atmosphere, which are kind of higher cost options, but they are also much more scalable because that, that scale is pretty much. Uh, and you can also get it from sources like limestone. We are technology neutral, agnostic about this. So it could be, I mean, the, the Danish are planning a molten salt reactor and as is, as is Torcon uh, in the United States. And they've already, they are already talk, talking with, with, with the big shipyards in, in South Korea. Our thinking is that it might be faster and easier to have a light water reactor made for this, like an SMR style. So maybe that's PWR yes, but or BWR. Regarding that, because of the media question earlier on regarding safety, the reason why traditional uh, nuclear power plants have so much conflict, this has much to do with, with the safety uh, containment uh, buildings uh, around the reactor. That aspect doesn't really change on a barge, uh, does it? 
No, but you can take it away from population, for example. And we know that, well, I mean, if you are able to build any reactors from that perspective, then you should be able to build these reactors as well, because the safety case is pretty much the same. You have that issue, yes, but these have, obviously there are some issue, uh, downsides for going for offshore siding, like the f movement and, and, and stuff like that, that you need to model and design for and, and all that stuff. You need to plan for so that pirates or Russians or, or someone else don't come and, and take over your power plant. I mean, they can do that on land as well, obviously. And, and there is actually, we've done a study, a, prelim, a, a small study on this, is that you could do this in such a way that you have a power plant that's flagged under Finland or Netherlands flag, and then you can take it to African coast. And basically that's, uh, if you're if it's under your flag, it's your territory. So you don't, and, and then you can cooperate with with the off taker, the, the buyer of the energy. Obviously, there needs to be some some contracts with with the government, stuff like that. But you can sell them the energy as a service, basically. Uh, just a short second question, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like I said, you could do this in in such a way. That refineries are often on the coast, so you can have these ships, park them on the harbor of the refinery. In which case, they will be less than a kilometer away from the actual refinery. So you can have a steam pipe from the reactor. So you can do combined heat and power, for example. I guess you can do something similar with cities, uh, but it might be easier to have a land-based reactor if it's a small city, because these can be a bit big. You can design smaller ones as well, but then you lose, obviously, the benefits as well. So it's, it's process heat and, and district heating is not the first kind of thing to do with these, I, I'd say, because they, they uh, need to be transported for, for a short distance. So the kind of main things are synthetic fuels and, and maybe power, because you can have a cable, you have offshore wind farms that are way out there and, and you just get a cable and, and, and it's fine. Why wouldn't you be able to do it with this as well? Um, but we actually did, uh, did um, this kind of multifunction ship, you can read about it in the in the EPRI report. Yeah, yeah, uh, which did power, ammonia, and water desalination. It's kind of cogeneration. So it uses some of the waste heat from the electrolyzers and and the reactor to desalinate water, also for use in in well, you could park it outside any dry region and there would be a customer for, for your desalinated water and the cost for, would be quite low. So this is something, I, I, you just need a couple of kilometers of pipeline to, to deliver the water and that's, that's pretty much doable. So you can, yes, you can do it. We're running out of time, but maybe one more. Mm. Has that really impacted the um, opinions in Finland? Has it really energized some? How, how would you look at that? Everybody loves Olki Lotto right now. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, even, I, even the kind of most hardcore people who opposed Olki Lotto back 20 years ago, 15 years ago, well, there was just an article in the paper. Yeah, I, I was really against that, but I'm kind of glad that it's now coming online because, <laughs> you know. Uh, so in that sense, the, the, the public acceptance in Finland is phenomenal at the moment. We had the energy minister just come out with a statement that we, got, we lost the Fennovoima project due to the Russian, because they were part owners and, and reactor suppliers. So that's 1.2 gigawatts out from our future plans. 
So the minister is now coming out and saying that I wish the nuclear utilities would really come up with new new projects like as soon as possible. So there is a high kind of political acceptance for that at the moment. Pretty much nobody opposes even new nuclear build at the moment in, in Finland. But of course, you always have the crazy people and, and like the hardcore opposers, but it's a very small minority. Um, yes, just stop me when the time is out. I, uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Um, well, Finland is actually designing one. We have the Technical Research Center in Finland that has a kind of nuclear program. They are designing a 50 megawatt thermal uh, light water reactor, no pressure. Uh, so it's only making like 120 degrees what you get in your espresso machine, basically. Uh, heating water. That's now in the phase that they're looking for a real somebody with, because it's a research institute, so they want to have a, a somebody with a couple million <laughs> euros and, and some um, to, to hire an engineering firm to actually draw the reactor and, and do the whole design. So they have a concept design. Uh, some other people, uh, I think the Czech are, are also developing this kind of, they, they plan to use the spend, spent fuel from Kandu reactors uh, as the Kind of fueling, so there's some, some, and these are usually in the tens of megawatts thermal. So you can power, uh, heat a, a small city with that, or if you get more of them, then of course you can heat a bigger one. But then there's the exciting opportunities to use combined heat and power with, with the slightly bigger reactors that we will probably hear about in in, in the afternoon session. Then you have the added flexibility of of, of because heat is the thing with heat is that you use pretty much 70% of the annual heat in, in, in just a couple of months time. So in the summer, you, you don't have much use for that. So the capacity factor is a bit lower, but if you, you can then use it to make electricity, you at least get something, something in the summer as well. I've done a whole study of, of this. It, it was in the, it, it's in the Tinkadom web, website called Dis uh, nuclear district heating in Finland. Okay, we good? With that, I thank you for your attention.